No one out here is trying to become the copyright police. That's today's guest, James Weaver, giving us the down low on the basics of licensing and the lowdown on Click and Clear. Welcome to Music Ed Insights. I'm Alan Fire, here with Steve Shanley. Each episode, Alan and I talk with national thought leaders in music education with practical insights for K-12 music educators. Steve, tell us about our guest. Dr. James Weaver is the Director of Performing Arts and Sports for the National Federation of State High School Associations and is our first repeat guest. Find his full bio, show notes, and significant resources at www.musicedinsights.com. This is as close as we've ever come to breaking news on this podcast. Click and Clear is a new and easy way to stay legally compliant when you stream concerts, record concerts, arrange music, and more. You won't hear my voice much on this one, but I'm still here. Steve is a professional educator and arranger, and he works with James here to get you what you need to know in a concise way, and I'll stay out of the way. I'll get out of the way right now so you can get to this important information for all music educators who ever perform music publicly with students. James Weaver, welcome to the program. Great. Thank you, Steve. Happy to be here. Well, let's start with a quick overview or refresher of the different types of licensing that we as music teachers need to be aware of. Sure. There's a lot of them. So uh, it goes everything from mechanical licensing, which is audio only um, recording and distribution licenses. We have public performance licensing, which is the ability to publicly perform things. Now, that only applies when you're in a non-educational setting. And how that's defined is you go from your classroom to the auditorium, you play that music, you go back to the classroom. Uh, Other areas where it strikes the entertainment side of things is where uh, we need public performance licensing. So that's most common in like a marching band, show choir, those kinds of areas in the music classroom. Uh, Everything else is kind of... um, contained underneath the education exemptions for public performance. So what but would the, be what would be an example of uh, of an instance where I would need a performance license for my marching band or show choir? So if I'm performing it in my auditorium, I don't need it. But what if I go to someone's contest across town and perform it in their auditorium? So if it's an adjudicated performance, you won't need the additional public performance licensing. Uh, when it slips into entertainment, like for example, during halftime of a football game, that's when we would need public performance uh, licensing for the school. And there's lots of options for that. And they're all school-based. It's not program-based. And uh, they're relatively inexpensive, which in that case, I will suggest the athletic departments purchase that because they're the ones that are going to need that license more than our, than our music programs. There's actually very little space where we would need to have that in music programs. Another area we would have to have it would be if we want to live stream concerts, then we would need a public performance license. That's great. And what about um, the uh, talking about show choir and marching band, these custom arrangement licenses? When when do I need to have one of those for my group? As soon as you make a custom arrangement. Um, so that was so the the idea of that is that. Anytime you make something that's more than a minor edit is when you need permissions. Now, we talk about things like licensing, as in like the only way to do this is through getting a a license that's paid for and all that kind of stuff. But really, when we think about license, think about it more broadly as you need permission, right? So that license could easily be an email saying, yep, go ahead and make that arrangement. Uh, I'm really happy you're doing it to yes, you may go ahead and do this, but it's going to cost you $250 uh, and we need to see your final product. Both of those things are technically uh, intellectual property licenses, Um, but we can think of that more easily as in permissions. Um, One is permissions you pay for and one is permissions you don't. Great. And last thing about these licenses, the first thing you mentioned was making recordings. So if I just simply make a recording, rehearsal recording of my jazz band, do I need a license for that? You do not. Uh, in fact, there's a quick hitter thing that I do uh, often when I give my copyright presentation at different state associations. So let me just kind of run that through. And I don't have my notes with me, so I stumble a moment. Forgive me. Uh, but if you're going to do an in-classroom recording, video or audio, and you're just going to play it back to the school, the uh, the students who are enrolled in your class, you need no licensing for that. That's an archival copy, and uh, you can do that all day long, as long as it's not distributed beyond those students within the classroom. Um, the next thing you would need uh, for permissions would be if you're going to do a performance uh, that's from the classroom to the stage, back to the classroom, you don't need any permissions from that. That's part of the educational component of what we do. 
uh, if you're going to record that con that uh, concert and distribute it to parents, if you do it through audio, you're going to need a mechanical license. If you do it through video, you're going to need a synchronization license. And that's the tricky one to get. Mechanical is easy. It's all compulsory. You just go to Harry Fox, uh, type in the song you're going to do, how long it is, and then you pay, I think, nine cents per recording. Uh, synchronization rights are non-compulsory, so you have to have permission uh, from the copyright owner in order to get those permissions. So that's a little bit harder and could be more costly. Um, if you're going to live stream, you need a public performance license. If you're going to perform beyond an educational setting, so um, whether we agree or disagree with this, but when it hits what we consider entertainment, you need public performance. That could be a marching band, could be show choir, could be um, pet band. Probably wouldn't be jazz band unless you're doing it for a club setting, then you probably need those permissions. Um, other than that, that's pretty much all the licensing we would need in the school, uh, besides the arrangement permissions, which are very specific. And those kick into play, like I said, as soon as we go beyond what is sort of minor edit. So the live stream, if I have my concert in my auditorium, mm -hmm. I cannot put that live on Facebook or YouTube without a license, even if I'm going to take it down immediately. It's just being simultaneously broadcast at the same time. I still need a license for that. So on, on Facebook and YouTube, they'll have you covered because they have licenses for that as long as it's live streamed. And live stream means that the event is happening, it's going live on the internet, and the event stops when, when your concert stops. Uh, and then the archive does not stay online. Yes, you can do that through Facebook and YouTube. They have permissions to do that. But if you're going to live stream through uh, your school's website or a, another party that uh, just provides a streaming outlet for your school, you would have to have public permissions for that. Great. And just a reminder to our listeners there, we talked about this in an earlier episode at length and also many great resources on the National Federation website that get more into the specifics. But I thought it would be helpful before we uh, dove into the, the subject of the day to just kind of have a quick refresher on that. So speaking of, very excited to learn about Click and Clear. Uh, tell us how Click and Clear can help with these licenses and maybe a little bit about your relationship with Click and Clear. Sure. Uh, so the NFHS has uh, has an organizational working with Click and Clear. Uh, and what we do there is they came to us actually in the cheer dance space, which I also oversee for the NFHS. And um, they basically provide um, real recordings for, sorry, master recordings for the um used for mashups, for the use of dances. And when they started looking at that, they're like, well, the permissions for this are really similar to the same permissions you would need for marching band and show choir. It's just uh, dealing with some of the print stuff, which was new for them. And so they came to us about a year, a little bit more than that ago, saying, hey, we have this system for you that uh, allows for easy clearance of permissions. And it's relatively inexpensive because of how they do their agreements with the publishers and the intellectual property holders. Um, and then they said, we also offer a verification system. Don't know if you're interested in that or not. And that's the part that actually piqued my interest was the licensing verification system. So as we started working through our beginnings of our relationship together, we realized, you know, the state associations could really use this licensing verification system. We have a similar one on the NFHS side, but it's not quite as robust as what the Click and Clear system offers because they are a technology company that handles intellectual property, and we are a educational support organization. So we have two very different directions in life, and I think both directions are important, and uh, they can do things we can do, and we can do things that they can't do. So. And and just to clarify, we'll we'll jump into the verification system a little bit later, but in case our listeners are wondering what that means, uh, I just want to confirm that I understand correctly. This would be for me as a contest or festival coordinator or for the state association that I belong to for me and them, basically to just confirm that everything that is happening at my event is copyright compliant. That's the verification, correct? That's the verification, exactly. I mean, because one thing you want to really make sure that everyone understands is that the licensing that we get uh, by and large is pretty good, but there's always a risk to the person who's hosting the event or the state association hosting the event uh, in a vicarious liability. So something's not 
done appropriately, whether intentionally or unintentionally. We always hope it's unintentional. Um, you know, we don't want anybody out there blatantly breaking copyright law because, again, that's against the law. Um, but what we want to do is make sure that everyone has kind of the I's dotted and the T's crossed and that everyone's on the up and up. So when we get to these events, we're not worried about copyright compliance. We're worried about are these students going to have a great experience in the field? Are they going to have a great experience on the stage? Are we going to have our adjudicators really focusing on the adjudication aspect of it and not have this um, liability component kind of dangling out there? Yeah. Well, you will probably understand just from the educational landscape of the last 20 years why some people might be initially a little suspicious that every time a new uh a new product comes along and we promise we're going to make this easier for you. And we know that before it was very difficult to write to the publishers and you'd never hear back and we're going to make this easy for you. And we promise we're not going to become the copyright police. Mm -hmm. And then that maybe kind of ends up happening to some degree. And in this instance, you know, built into this is this verification system, uh, it almost sounds like yeah, we're going to provide this service and sort of become the copyright police. And I know that that's not the intent, but can you sort of speak to people who might be a little concerned about, OK, here we go again? No, 100 percent. I agree. And no one out here is trying to become the copyright police. Uh, what we're trying to do is just make sure that the the educators have an easy path to good licensing that does all the things they needed to do. Uh, and that the rights holders who own the copyrights to all these works have uh, proper remuneration for uh, the work and effort that they put into this creative industry. You know, one thing we need to remember is in education, um, we forget often how expensive it is to creatively make all these pieces. Uh, and it's because, you know, I don't want to get on my soapbox, but I will a little bit. We're drastically under-resourced in a lot of ways in the entire education ecosystem. And so it makes it hard to be like, well, why are we paying $500 for intellectual property rights to make this arrangement when I'm the one making the arrangement and doing the work? Well, it's because that piece that you're arranging wouldn't even exist if someone couldn't make money off of that. And so if we think of intellectual property, like physical property, it, it makes it a little bit easier to go that way. Um, you wouldn't just go into a gas station and steal a giant bag. of Well, maybe you would. Hopefully no one does. But you wouldn't steal a giant bag of chips because that'd be, that'd be weird and awkward. And no one thinks that socially that's acceptable. Same thing's true with intellectual property. So when we look at what we're doing here, just like you mentioned, Steve, when we were talking about okay, here's another organization that has licensing verifications. They're going to verify everything we're doing. Uh, plus they're selling the product and that kind of stuff. Does it turn out to be kind of a Gestapo maneuver? Uh, the idea and the intent behind it is we are a service organization and Click and Clear in this regard is helping our state associations become a better service organization by protecting everybody. Um, I've known these guys for a while now and nothing that I have has been indicated to me at the moment um, has been saying like, we want to make sure we go out and ask every school that they've actually have their licenses. This is for the state associations to say, we're gonna host state marching band. We need to see your license because we've now been asking for that since 2015, that is not new, but we're gonna do it this way where we have an automated component that'll verify the licenses that are submitted to us and that everyone's on the up and up and that I don't have to spend state association director I don't just spend weeks of my time making sure that we're all covered. This is going to happen more in an automated process. Well, this is good. I was going to dive into that a little bit later, but I think we pretty extensively covered that, which, which is good, except for one thing. So I, a problem I have always had since we have started this, like you said, around 2015, is if Alan says he's coming to my jazz band contest and he uploads the first page of each of the three scores that he's going to play. Um, and it looks okay to me, looks okay to the NFHS or to Click and Clear or whoever. If Alan shows up and just switches out his second tune for an illegal arrangement, like at some point we have to we just have to go based on trust, right? Or he says he's going to play it. And in Iowa, for example, we don't have scores required, sheet music scores for these contests. So he could say he's playing it and and not play it at all, or maybe just play the first page and then do his own Allen custom arrangement after that. So like there's still 
there is no way to just really unless we have the copyright compliance person at every festival with the sheet music scores to follow along mm-hmm. i mean and and like you don't see that coming right we're just oh no we're kind of we're kind of going based on the honesty of the of the director so in that case i'll be real honest here this year at one of the festivals i ran instead of using the nfhs site i kind of made my own google form that basically said list your first tune composer arranger etc cetera, etc cetera. if you have a custom arrangement call me and we'll figure it out and then at the end they have to say you know click yes or no i am to the best of my abilities abiding by copyright and they click yes what is the difference between my pretty easy google form that i will say also allows me to collect all of the repertoire that is being performed which is awesome for educational purposes when i can say here's what all the jazz bands at my festival did this year if you want to look at at the repertoire for your own programming and and maybe uh, this site Cl- click and clear site Sure. Well, we can do the click and clear one and the current NFHS copyright compliance database one, right? Because both of them operate in similar fashions. It's just mine operates more the way your Google form operated and theirs goes through a, a verification system. So for example, the big difference will go through. And uh, as we are collecting the tunes, it'll say, here's the license agreement you have, which you would also collect. They have a system that will read those licenses and say, yep, you have a checkbox on the arrangement, you have a checkbox on the right name, you have a checkbox on uh, synchronization for distribution, uh, you don't have for choreography, and they'll get a, like a yellow checkbox, which for jazz band, you don't need that. So that is fine. Uh, because you're not going to hopefully you're not choreographing your jazz bands. I'm sure someone is but hopefully <laughs> that's not a norm, right? Um, but uh but so that that's kind of what this will do is kind of go through and read that for you and say, yep, this is there, this is there, this is there, this is there. Uh, and then at the end, it's still up to the state association to say, I accept that this has all been all been read and verified or whatever. Or if there's places missing, like that choreography example in jazz band, be like, I'm going to accept this because we don't we don't need those permissions for this particular event. And they'll hit accept. And then the school get an email saying all your stuff's been verified and you're accepted. Welcome to the deal. We're excited to see you there. Um and then if it's not accepted, it gives me an opportunity to email saying, hey, while reviewing your con- your agreements, you're missing um, arrangement permissions for this medley you put together. Um, please go ahead and submit that for us, right? So it allows the ability to have that conversation as compared to uh, the, yep, we trust everyone did the right thing. And it looks like everyone submitted something. So here we go. Um, you know, we want to make sure that it's a little bit more robust than just the everyone submitted a checkbox. So a little more robust, but also, uh, unlike my Google form, more readily available help to uh, address any of the problems that might be up versus here's uh, Steve's cell phone number. Give him a call and he'll try and, and help you through it to the best of his abilities. So really thinking of it more as a as a resource. Mm-hmm. And and also, I think I think this system more than the one I used this year helps protect directors from themselves making yeah. inadvertent errors. So, for example, you mentioned that if it's show choir, we need to have the the choreography checkbox. So when I um, if I approach Alfred or a third party, you know, Pub, uh, private company to help me secure a custom arrangement license for a show choir that I'm directing. I don't remember seeing anything about choreography, whether there was choreography involved or or not with that. Um, is that is that a part of the custom arrangement license itself, or is that only for a possible synchronization license if there's going to be video made? Yes, that would be for the uh, the actual arrangement for itself. And the reason why you probably don't see that in there is because when you submit something for show choir, there's an inherent knowledge there that says there'll be choreography to this. Got so it. when you say, yes, you may arrange this for show choir, they're also saying you're going to arrange this for show choir. We anticipate you having choreography. Alfred, Alfred knows that there's oh, yeah. going to be some choreography along with that. Yeah, correct. Otherwise, it's not show choir. It's just choir. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That makes uh, sense. Yeah. And so that that's kind of where that goes in. And, um, you know, I think the other part of that is to transition to smidgen is that with the click and clear platform, and I'm not doing a commercial for click and clear, but it is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of convenience there. So they can handle all those, 
excuse me, so they can handle all those permissions for you uh, as you um, as you're selecting your tunes and whatnot and work with, you know, Alfred and Hell Leonard and any other publisher you want to work with, uh, just similar to all the current ones that exist there as well. So there's a there's an integrated system there that exists. You don't have to use the integrated system, but it's convenient. Let's do a commercial for Click and Clear. I got no problem with that. We <laughs> all right, the, the mission of this podcast is to help K-12 educators, and it sounds to me like this can help K-12 music teachers. So uh, talk us through maybe what is different about Click and Clear versus me trying to go straight to Hal Leonard or maybe some of the other um, companies that have, have provided this service in the past. Mm -hmm. So as we know, there's lots of companies that have provided the service and will continue to provide the service. Um, the click and clear component for like marching band and show choir in the music or custom arrangement arena is relatively new. But like I mentioned earlier, they've been doing this a long time in the cheer and dance space. And uh, they've got a, a very vast and growing catalog and they have working agreements with all the major publishers. So just like we do with some of the other groups that are out there. Um, some of the differences that occur is that when you get your license through Click and Clear, uh, it comes with an automatic verification check mark. So if you order it through them and say, hey, I'm going to do these five pieces of my marching band, uh, they'll obviously they need to go get permission for everything. There's no such thing as automatic permission. Um, but in this group and in Click and Clear and with other uh, entities that do this, they have working agreements that are non-exclusive to work with all these publishers. And with those agreements, it's more of like a fast tracked permission more than it is an automatic permission where the band director or the choir director or whoever uh, doesn't have that kind of relationship. So when they do it, they're going through general customer service, which now can take, you know, eight, 12 plus weeks where Click and Clear and other organizations that do this are down to, you know, two, three, four weeks to make those permissions happen. And then you kind of move from there. So the pre-cleared works that I'm looking at right now on Click and Clear, mm -hmm. um, you 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 might prefer the term fast tracked. Like you still have to get the permission, but uh, this list of pre-cleared, we can tell you with pretty good certainty that we're going to be able to get the permission fast. So actually, if it's pre-cleared, it's instant. Okay, right. So it has the green check mark on, or the it's like a green. I don't have it in front of me, so I apologize. But it's like a green globe or a green checkbox. Uh, that is means that they already have permissions to do what people are asking for them to do, and they can go ahead and get that done. If it's yellow, it means that they have kind of more of that fast track ability, saying we have an organizational relationship with this publisher. Um, go ahead and submit what you'd like, and we'll go ahead and use our back channel to go ahead and get those permissions for you. And their, you know, their prices are, are relatively. Uh, um, reasonable, right? So it's about $200, $250 per tune to go ahead and get those uh, customer arrangement permissions. And we know right now they can vary from like $75 to $600 or $1,000 and, you know, kind of all over the place. So they're trying to bring kind of a, a more predictable price point to that. So if something, for example, in my experience, the 20th century, quote unquote, classical music, if you think about Prokofiev or or Copeland or something that tends to be really expensive at least. And is that probably going to continue to be the case even through click and clear or were, were they able to negotiate some better rates for, for school groups? So that's a good question. I think we're actually going to um, see what that looks like moving forward, but I, I would anticipate the way I've been seeing a lot of other things come through. Uh, they seem to have a pretty good ability to get those costs kind of under control. Uh, and, you know, because of them being a technology company that can really forward this stuff on, they're able to kind of keep the overhead of doing all this a little bit low as well. So I think that all helps as far as that goes. Uh, but you're right. I think some of those places like John Williams, right? You can't just be like, oh, well, John Williams is in here. I guarantee we're going to get the stuff. We all know how John Williams works. I was going to ask that next. So John Williams, Prince, those are still probably going to be denied if I want to arrange those for my marching band. Yeah, I mean, and, and the reason why is, I mean, we obviously know that, uh, like, John Williams is the first billion-dollar composer. We know that he's very strict on the stuff that you can do with his music. And um, I think that's created a good quality control thing for John Williams. So those things that we've always struggled with will continue to struggle no matter what the system is. Unless John Williams decides to open up his own customer arrangement uh, platform, then we know we're set. But I don't. <laughs> yeah, probably not going to happen anytime soon. Right. Uh, well, speaking of some of those other those struggles, another one that has been confusing 
uh, slash frustrating is this um, most favored nations clause. Can I nerd out a little bit with you and and go on that? So uh, this idea that if I'm going to make a medley for my marching band and one piece was written by Alan and one piece was written by James and Alan wants to charge me $200 to use his piece in the medley and James wants to charge me 400 that there are uh, some schools of thought that say if I'm combining those into one artistic work, then even though Alan is only charging me 200, if I'm paying James 400, I need to pay Alan 400 also. Uh, where is click and clear on that as far as medleys go? Uh, so that I can't speak to specifically because I've not asked him about uh, most favored nations clause, but the most favored nations clause is actually in the copyright law itself. And so it's not a practice or anything like that you can try to negotiate that but that technically is the law and so um i don't i'm not sure there's a way around that uh if like alan has a problem be getting 400 uh and he's like 200 is fine but in the law part when you put them together you're supposed to then have uh the most favored nations clause which is like an even an even uh, royalty paid to both both creators I, I'm just grateful that you're using my name as an example because I'm kind of staying out of the way while you two uh, talk about this stuff. And and, and uh, 200 would be just fine. <laughs> All right, I guess I can do 200 too, Steve. But, uh... check, check is in the mail. Okay, so uh, that's a that's a good clarification on that. So click and clear can handle medleys. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because that has been um, as new platforms have developed and had access to um, to catalogs in recent years, it's been very exciting, but one of the limitations for some of them is this inability to, to do medleys. So Mm -hmm. I think that, and as you know, with marching band and show choir in 2023, uh, it's all about the medleys and keeping things seamless in that regard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Great. Anything else about uh, click and clear licensing that uh, would be helpful for us to know that maybe helps set it apart, uh, other features it has? I will admit when I go to the website, it's it's a little daunting at first. Uh, there's there's a lot there. And especially if I'm just a marching band director and and I just want to get permission to arrange a couple Beatles tunes for my for my marching band there's a lot of stuff to click through and and as you said you know I could kind of tell that maybe it was originally a cheer dance and the the sync and mechanical licenses are were maybe the bread and butter and then we're kind of adding the the custom arrangement thing afterwards yeah and I wouldn't think of the uh customer arrangement as an afterthought. I mean they put a lot into what they need to have for that. And so when you go to the ensemble arrangements uh section, it's basically going to bring up a form that's like what songs do you want to do? Uh and then as you type that in there it'll start searching as database for things that already has relationships with or not. And then that's why to ask for some of the information that it asks for uh saying go get those permissions. I think what makes them unique is the fact that they're um very customer service friendly. Uh, they try to do things as quickly and as inexpensively as possible. And I know there's always that worry like, well, how long will that last? Um, I think it'll last for a while and we don't really know for sure. Uh, but I, the guys we've been working with, the, they're transparent, they're honest. Uh, they want to make it better for music education and they want to make it so people get proper remuneration for the works that they have done. Uh, and I think when like anyone who works deep in the copyright world, like I work very deep in the copyright world, I want things to be as cheap, easy and fast as possible for schools. But I also want to make sure that all of our copyright creators are paid fairly for the work that they do. Uh, finding that balance point is is tricky. And I think using tools like the Click and Clear platform um, make that easier to do, especially when we're talking customer arrangements, because that world is just different. And, um, you know, it's, it's taking a lot of growing, right? Like even when it, if, if we go back 20 years ago, was like, I'll contact the publisher and I'll hear back in two months or so um, of if I got the customer arrangement. That's how it was for a long time. Then we had new companies come on board. like, we can streamline this and make it quicker. And they did. And then some other things have kind of changed to make that a little bit more difficult. But at the end of the day, um, we really want to have a good, easy platform that they that people can go through and get great customer arrangement permissions from and that it's easy for the states to verify. 
And if those two things exist, it's going to make it easier, faster, and hopefully cheaper for all parties involved, which is what we really want to see happen. And this is the first time that I know that we've had like all of the stars aligned to make that happen across the entire spectrum. And just to clarify, if uh, I am using Click and Clear as a festival coordinator to uh, ensure I'm being my groups are being as compliant as possible, uh, and they are using a different means for securing their custom arrangement licenses, like mm -hmm. that's okay. They can that's okay. they can use they can upload whatever they need to if they got permission directly from the publisher or from another another. Uh, business that yeah. helped them with that so it isn't just it needs to be all click and clear for everything is that correct that is correct yeah but it is easier if you go through click and clear right because then once those permissions clear on their system it automatically updates your profile and verifies everything automatically uh for the festival manager or the state director uh, but if you're going to go through a different organization that's like hey we do this as well for customer management permissions and you've been using that company for a long time and you feel good and comfortable with that company um, you can continue to use that. And all you do then is you just upload your agreement permissions and then it would just kind of read the agreement and say, yep, everything is all there. And then the tournament director or the um, state association director would be able to see that. Yep. We're, not, we're not trying to take business away from everyone else. It's just another option and an option that we can make sure is all verified. Is there anything we talked about that uh, as great as click and clear is, it's not going to get me a, a John Williams uh, arrangement for my for my middle school marching band, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Anything else that we should just be upfront about that Click and Clear currently can't help with if there are any catalogs unavailable or types of ensembles that it's not handling yet? So right now it's able to kind of handle all of those things. Um, their catalog is growing quickly. I think we're, if there's a, 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 not a negative, but a growing pain that exists is just how quickly the, approval process goes, but that's for everybody. That's not necessarily a click clear specific thing, uh, but they are working to to expedite that. And I know their catalog is growing by leaps and bounds. So for an example, I was uh, giving this conversation to a cheer and dance group, uh, all of our state administrators from cheer and dance the other day. And from the day I had prepped for my meeting to the day we had the meeting, which was three days later, uh, they added 18,000 new pieces. And so it's like, all right, so this is definitely definitely going right and so i think as that continues to move forward we're going to see more and more efficiencies built into the system for sure and if uh alan requests a piece that hasn't been cleared or dealt with in the past and they go through all the the process to get it done then a week later when i request it presumably it's going to move much quicker it should move much quicker yep so alan will do the hard work and then steve and i can uh Reap the benefits of that. Thank you, Alan. That sounds like a, a great deal. Yeah. Well, we know that we've already had you on in the past and, and had lightning round with you. But uh, as you and Alan and I were discussing before we started recording, I think if we if we tried to end the episode without a lightning round, I think we'd get <laughs> we'd get some complaints. So are, are you up for five new lightning round questions? Just don't make them too hard. I'm ready. I, I like how this process pushed Steve to come up with more lightning round questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm working. I'm working too hard on this episode, Alan. <laughs> All right. Favorite place to eat, not in Indianapolis, but the whole U S of a. Oh man. So I'm fortunate. I've eaten tons of places uh, around the country. And I will say for everyone out there, every state and every city has an incredible restaurant. So let's just put that out there. It's that way I'm still invited to go places. Um, but I would have to say uh, Cafe Ferrello um, in New York. Uh, it's between Central Park and Lincoln Center. It is an amazing place, outdoor seating. Uh, have the meatball pizza there with an old fashioned and be awesome. Is there a piece of music you'd be just fine never hearing again? Oh, um, yes. Uh, so in the non-education space, I'm going to go with uh, the Umbop song from Hanson Brothers. If I never hear that one more time, I'm in good shape. All right. A favorite film or TV series you've been streaming recently? Yeah. So I just finished the Ted Lasso. Um, uh, it's not done yet. There's one more episode, but I just finished streaming all that. I kind of binge watched a bunch of it on an airplane. It was great. So if you haven't seen that one, it's like a textbook case in leadership and development of uh, relationships. It's fantastic. And are you fortunate enough to have your next vacation planned? Um, I'm not sure what the term vacation means, um, but I do have some, 
some like random downtime planned uh, at the end of June where I'm taking my kids back to South Dakota for uh, about a week and just have them go run out and um, learn what it is like to be in the outdoors again and, and have some peaceful time out there. And finally, what's the guilty pleasure song that you always sing along to while driving in the car by yourself? So that's funny because I only listen to NPR in the car. Uh, but whenever my daughter's with me, she listens to all the pop radio stuff. So I, that's where I get my education from. And there's this great song called Old Friends by Ben Ben Rector, I think is his name. Um, if you haven't heard it, it's one of those tearjerker, heartstring pulling songs, but it is fantastic. Dr. James Weaver, thank you so much for joining us today and providing this service to our listeners. Fun to see you again. Awesome. Thank you, Alan Steve. Pleasure being here. You've been listening to Music Ed Insights. Please support this podcast by subscribing, rating, and reviewing it. We want to make this as thoughtful and practical as possible. Please send us your ideas for guests and suggestions for improvement. You can do that through our website, www.musicedinsights.com. You can also reach us on our Facebook page, Music Ed Insights, or via Twitter, at Music Ed Insights. Our website is also the place to find program notes, links, and a one-page download of this episode's key takeaways. That's www.musicedinsights.com. This podcast is sponsored and supported by Normal Design, Winterset Websites, Group Dynamic, and the Co College Music Education Program. Learn more about them at our website and let us know if your business or organization would like to join that list. New episodes drop every two weeks on Monday mornings. Get current, stay relevant. Music Ed Insights.